Since 2011, FACT has been devoted to caring for the earth and her people by calling together followers of all faith traditions to carry out our interfaith mission, which is to educate, inspire, advocate, and organize for a just transition to renewable energy sources and sustainable practices and policies that address the problem of climate change. Of course, both humans and wildlife are affected by the environmental harms that we are experiencing today. Think of the thousands of fish that were killed in the streams in East Palestine and the domestic animals that also died there. While many hundreds of people there have been sickened and all fear future diagnoses of cancer and other diseases. I am proud to report that FACT has raised more than $4,000 to aid East Palestine and additional funds have been raised by our partner, the Ohio Council of Churches. Reverend Dr. Bob Miller of Emanuel United Methodist Church in East Palestine has told us that they purchased 14 air purifiers with the funds that we raised for the folks in that town. We are proud that Reverend Miller has joined our FACT Board of Directors. If you have been with us a while, you know that FACT's Distinguished Speaker Series presents prominent environmentalists, science writers, journalists, and authors of both fiction and nonfiction with themes that deal with the environment and environmental justice. In today's program, we will hear about the nature of oaks, the trees that support a, a variety of wildlife, and that sequester more carbon, protect our watersheds, and nourish soil communities better than any other plant genus in North America. We hope that you enjoy today's program, and we hope that you can join us for our upcoming programs. If you visit our website, factohio.org, you can see announcements for these events as they are organized, and you can register for upcoming Distinguished Speaker events. We thank our many supporters and donors who make our programming possible. If you can, we would appreciate whatever donation you can make to FACT so that we can keep bringing you engaging speakers like Doug Tallamy. And so we can continue to strengthen FACT's other programs like FACT's Project to Educate Ohioans on the threats now posed by toxic brine spreading and from oil and, from oil and gas wells and the proliferation of frac waste injection wells and soon we will launch a new program on climate change. And as you can see, you can donate by mailing your check to post office box 1235 in Ohio. Or you can donate via our pay PayPal link at our website, factohio.org. Thank you. Following Doug's talk today, there will be a Q&A period to ask a question, simply type your question in the chat and our monitor, uh, Ann or I, will read them aloud to Doug to answer. And after the uh, Q&A session, we're gonna have a drawing for copies of Doug's book, The Nature of Oaks. We're, today, we're, we have such a large registration today, we're gonna, make, we're gonna draw three names. And uh, don't leave once you, if you are a winner, don't leave right away. Um, make sure that you um, type in the chat your contact information, your mailing address, so we can mail the book to you if you're one of the winners. At this time, I would like to introduce our FAC president, Pastor Margaret Mills, who will deliver the invocation. And I'm gonna stop the slideshow and I'm going to spotlight her. And let me stop the share. There I am. Margaret. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us with this um, next in our Distinguished Speaker Series. We're glad you're here and we're grateful to Doug for being with us as well. Will you join me this afternoon? I have a, a reading. I used this prayer once before, but I didn't do the um, story part of it. So for the invocation, this was written by a pastor named Reverend Dr. Chuck Curry. And it goes like this. Last year, we lost a tree in our front yard. It had been sick when we first moved in and nothing the tree doctors could do would save it. A mold had taken its life. 
So last fall, we had it removed and we replaced with this tree, a black gum that has beautiful fall leaves. Mixed in with the soil are ashes from our beloved cats, Freedom and Eric Broccoli. In the Portland climate, this tree should do well. Unfortunately, we're not the best garden people. And during this spell of hot weather, our tree didn't get the water it needed and many of its leaves have burned. Liz has fixed that problem and the tree should be good to go. But being a minister, it seemed a prayer was called for. Google couldn't provide me with any. Don't people pray for trees, he asked. So I wrote the one above for our tree and for all trees. Francis and Catherine joined me in offering this prayer as we held hands around the tree. I invite us to envision ourselves holding hands around the trees that we, are, um, we have in our lives, our yards, our forests, and that we'll hear about today from Doug as we hear this prayer. Creator God, out of chaos, you brought order. Out of nothingness, you brought life. In the middle of all life stands the tree. Trees provide the air that nurtures all your creation. Birds make them their homes. Cats climb them for protection. Trees recycle life that has come before. Bless the trees of this world, loving God. Remind us to serve as their caregivers and protectors. Give them long limbs and long life. The gift of their breath is as special to us as the breath of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Margaret. Now it is my pleasure to welcome Doug Tallamy, today's distinguished speaker. Douglas W. Tallamy is professor and chair of the Department of Etymology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware in Newark. Chief among his research goals is to better understand the many ways insects interact with plants and how such interactions determine the diversity of animal communities. Doug Tallamy is a T.A. Baker Professor of Agriculture in the Department of Etymology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware, where he has authored 112 research publications mm -hmm. and has taught insect related courses for 42 years. Chief among his research goals is to better understand the many ways insects interact with plants and how such interactions determine the diversity of animal communities. His books include Bringing Nature Home, The Living Landscape, co-authored with Rick Dark, Nature's Best Hope, a New York Times bestseller, The Nature of Oaks, winner of the American Horticultural Society's 2022 Book Award. In 2021, he co-founded Homegrown National Park with Michelle Afandari, homegrownnationalpark.org. His awards include recognition from the Garden Writers Association, Audubon, the National Wildlife Federation, Allegheny College, Eco Professors, the Garden Club of America, and the American Horticultural Association. Thank you, Doug, for being with us. Thank you, Ron. Uh, I am very happy to say I am not the chair anymore. Thank goodness. <laughs> um, it, is, it is a pleasure to talk to groups that are concerned about sustainability because, of course, unsustainable is not a future. Um, so, you know, we're going to talk about uh, the nature of oaks today mostly about the things that depend on oaks, but uh, oaks are one of the mechanisms that are gonna make our, our future sustainable. Uh, before we talk about that though, let's, I wanna remind you uh, what E.O. Wilson told us way back in 1987, and that was that insects are the little things that run the world and that life as we know it depends on insects. If they were to disappear, so would 90% of our flowering plants, terrestrial food would, would collapse and all the animals dependent upon them would disappear decomposers would be lost and all we'd have is bacteria and fungi that, that uh, so the earth would essentially rot. Um, and unfortunately we have a problem because we are losing those insects. We've already lost more than 45% of the insects on, on the planet. And we're losing them because 
of what we do. Lights kill insects, neonicotinoids, that's what we, the pesticides we use in our agriculture areas, they kill insects. Deforestation kills insects, cars kill insects, climate change kills insects. When you take an area like this and you turn it into that, it kills insects. So what does this have to do with oaks? Well, there is no better way to share our spaces with insects than to plant an oak. And that's what I want to talk about today. We're going to follow uh, one particular oak that I planted on our property uh, shortly after we moved in. Uh, Cindy and I bought a, a, a 10 acres of a farm that was broken up in the year 2000. It had been mowed for hay before they broke it up. And when you mow for hay in Southeast Pennsylvania, you're really mowing all the rootstocks of all the invasive species that have escaped from our gardens. Uh, so it was out of mowing three years before we actually moved in. And when we moved in, the property looked like that. Uh, it was just a tangled mass of, of Asian, Asian plants. So a lot of people throw up their hands at that point and say, well, well, there's nothing we can do. But I want to tell you, getting rid of invasives is not as hard as it seems. You just get your wife to do it. it <laughs> so she did do it. And, and what she was, uh, after she cleared some spaces, I started planting plants. That year, uh, a number of uh, acorns dropped from an oak about a mile and a half down down the road. And I got them. I planted them. It was a white oak. And white oaks germinate in the fall. They send down a root. Uh, and that's pretty much all they do in the fall. Then in the spring, they send up their first leaves, and that's about all they do that first year. And it makes people think that oaks grow really slowly. Uh, well, they're not growing slowly. They're just doing most of their growth that first year underground. In the first year, they're growing 10 times more root biomass than leaf biomass. Uh, so, uh, And those roots will, will serve that uh, oak very well in the future. There's our little oak. We're going to follow that. I've got a deer cage around it. Where I live, if you don't have a deer cage, you don't have an, an oak. And this is what it looked like 18 years later. It was 45 feet tall, 47 inch circumference, had a canopy spread of 30 feet. Still a baby, of course, but it's a real landscape tree and it didn't take that long. So one of my messages today is that oaks are a lifeline to a number of species. There are dozens of species of birds that depend on oaks. Uh, number of mammals as well, including rodents, but the big guys too, bears, raccoons, possums, not that many reptiles depend on oaks, but there are several species of butterflies that are uh, host specific on oaks. Hundreds of species of moths depend on them as well as their predators and parasitoids. We'll talk about cynipid gall wasps, actually thousands of species of cynipid gall wasps, um, june beetles, longhorn beetles, metallic wood boring beetles, weevils, Lots of spiders and, and dozens more species of arthropods and mollusks and annelids depend on the leaf litter underneath the oaks. So you have a very complex community of life associated with oaks. And the problem is nobody knows that. If it's unnoticed, it goes unappreciated. And that's why I wrote The Nature of Oaks. Uh, it is a month by month guide to the life that's on your oaks. So you can go outside at any time of the year and look at the things that I'm, I'm talking about. And the idea of course, uh, was to provide the knowledge and hope that it generates interest. And interest often leads to compassion. Uh, and compassion often leads to action. And we need a lot more compassion and action towards saving the natural world these days. So first, a few facts. The genus Quercus in the uh, North America contains 91 species, three, 435 species globally. Uh, Quercus comes from the Celtic quer, meaning fine, and quez meaning tree. So oaks are indeed fine trees. This, by the way, makes it a very large genus uh, of deciduous trees. Most, most deciduous uh, trees are not that speciose. There are four major taxonomic sections in the genus that are common in North America, and you hear these terms, so we'll mention them briefly. There's the white oak group. That's the Quercus group. The red oak group is Lobati. Live oak group is Varentes and a much smaller canyon oak group called Protobalanus that is more common in the West. This is the distribution of oaks in North America. Mm -hmm. There's at least one species of oak that occurs everywhere except where it's brown. Uh, so in the high plains and the, the uh, upper Rocky Mountains, you don't have any oaks, but um, center of distribution is down here in the Southeast, but a number of oaks in Ohio, um, Actually, 200 species of oaks are down here in Mexico, so uh, there, there are oaks all over the place. They live a lot longer than we think. Uh, in Europe, these are uh, statistics from Europe, but the average uh, lifespan of an oak, when it's not disturbed, is 900 years. 300 years of growth, 300 years of stasis, and 300 years of decline. And during each one of those periods of growth, 
uh, they're delivering unique ecosystem services. The reason they don't live that long is because of the way we treat them. What is the oldest oak in the country? Uh, you know, people are always debating what that is, but it's probably the Penchenka oak uh, in California. It's a coastal live oak estimated to be 2,000 years old. Uh, but if you really want the oldest oaks, you've got to go to the small ground hugging species uh, in the West. This is the Palmer oak. Uh, estimated to be 13,000 years old. So it grows uh, for a number of years here, then move, you know, roots over here and just kind of creeps along the ground. Um, so they're not very spectacular trees, but they are very, very old. Some of the oldest things on the planet. They can get big. This was the Y oak in Y, Maryland, the largest white oak in, in North America. It was a big fella. I got to see it before it blew over in a hurricane, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago now. Um, but another one of my messages is that not all oaks are gigantic, and there are some small ones we can get into our yards when they're not very big. And then finally, we're going to talk about oaks having superior ecological function. Um, they have the highest biodiversity value, meaning they're supporting more species than any other tree. They're sequestering more carbon dioxide, so they're helping climate change. Best soil stabilizers because of their big root systems. They make the best leaf litter because it lasts the longest. Uh, mm -hmm. And all of that promotes healthier watersheds. So I started the book in October. And people say, why'd you start in October? Well, October is when my wife, Cindy, said, you should write a book about oaks. So I did. Uh, and this is the oak that we're following. Um, and of course, October is, is when you're going to notice uh, all those acorns that, that are produced. It is the month acorns start dropping. And oaks make a lot of acorns, up to 3 million acorns in the lifetime of a single oak. And each one of those acorns is a source of fat and protein. It's a nice little package of food that a number of animals depend on. Again, a lot of rodents depend on, on uh, acorns. So do bears. They're roaming the woods, gathering up as much acorns as they can because that's what provides the fat that gets them through the winter. Uh, but other mammals do as well, raccoons. And of course, those squirrels love the acorns and those lovely deer, they like acorns too. Many birds depend on acorns. Turkeys are doing just what the black bears are doing. They're wandering around the uh, woods eating as many acorns as possible. So they have enough fat to get through the winter. red belly woodpeckers, titmice, towhees, uh, flickers, all kinds of birds love acorns, particularly ducks, wood ducks in particular. You know, when, it, and when a, a viable acorn hits the water, it sinks. So the ducks dive down and they get it, or they come right up on the, on the ground and eat as many acorns as they can. Mm -hmm. Sandhill cranes, um, they would gather where there were oak mass and again, eat those acorns to get through the winter. A lot of invertebrates depend on acorns as well. This is the acorn weevil tunneling out of an acorn. Uh, and that's what it looks like as an adult. They can be really common in acorns. This is a group of moths called acorn moths. They all look alike. So you need DNA to separate the species, but there's a number of them. And the caterpillar develops in the acorn uh, and then they tunnel out and then become a moth. So all these things are eating acorns. And just a, a week or two after those acorns drop from the tree, if you look under the tree, it's utter destruction. And you might wonder how an oak tree ever actually gets to, to uh, germinate offspring. And this is where a, a very ancient mutualism comes to the rescue, and it's a relationship between jays, jays of uh, all species around the world, and oaks. They both evolved uh, in what is now the Arctic about 56 million years ago, and right away those two lineages got to, to like each other. Oaks, of course, provide those acorns that, that help jays get through the winter. Jays gives oaks mobility. As a matter of fact, oaks can move farther and faster than any other deciduous tree genus in the world because of jays. And this is how that happens. Jays are taking those acorns, they're storing them for winter food. They don't cache them, so they're not putting a whole bunch in one place. They can carry more than one at a time, but they bury them singly. Uh, so they'll pick up an acorn, then they'll fly up to a mile, some people say a mile and a half from the parent tree, and they tap that acorn below the surface of the soil, usually in a disturbed place. Now, if they think another jay has watched them do that, they'll wait a few minutes and they'll dig up their acorn and move it because jays know that jays steal acorns. Then of course, the winter time, they're gonna go back and find that acorn and have something to eat. Well, they're busy in the fall. A single jay can bury up to 4,500 acorns every fall, but they only remember where one out of every four is. Uh, so that means a single jay can actually plant 
3,360 oak trees every year. And if they're doing that a mile from the parent tree, that's what allow those trees to, or oaks to disperse faster than, than other types of trees. It's not just blue jays doing it. This is the scrub jay in Oregon. Again, all the species of jays are moving those, those acorns around. Stellar's jay, by the way, they just changed the name. No more, no more uh, um, human names on, on birds. So I don't know what this is going to become. This Mexican scrub jay, the green jay, they're all doing it. Now, this is an acorn wheat woodpecker. It's not a jay, uh, but it also has a, a specialized relationship with acorns in the Southwest. It's a very beautiful bird. They're storing acorns in the wintertime, just like uh, jays do, but they don't do it underground. They stick the acorn in a hole that they've drilled into a tree, call it an acorn tree. Uh, and then the acorn spends the winter in that hole. Well, acorn trees are really valuable resources. Uh, so entire families of acorn woodpeckers will protect those, those trees from other acorn woodpeckers. Uh, and if you, and they use the trees year, year after year after year. So if you have an acorn tree in your yard, it's really entertaining. All right, November is when you might look back and say, well, gee, there were a lot of acorns this year or there were not very many acorns. Um, and that is another feature of oaks that's unusual. When they produce a lot of acorns, we call it a mast year. And when they don't, we don't call it anything. Uh, but masting is so unusual. It's very asynchronous production of, of fruiting bodies that ecologists want to explain it. And they've got at least four hypotheses that are not mutually exclusive. They all could be operating at the same time to explain why oaks mast. Predator satiation, predator reduction, improved pollination, and energy partitioning. So we'll look briefly at each one of those. Predator satiation, this is an acorn weevil larva outside of the acorn. Again, they can be really numerous. Up to 90% of the acorns on a tree can have an acorn weevil larva in it. Uh, so the acorn weevils and the acorn moths and the squirrels and the deer, everybody eating acorns, if oaks made the same number of acorns every single year, the population of all those acorn eaters would stabilize around the number of acorns and they'd eat them all, which means the oaks would have a tough time reproducing. But if they vary the number of acorns, so one year they make a whole bunch, supports a whole lot of squirrels, a whole lot of acorn weevils, and the next year they make very, very few or none, then the populations of these acorn eaters crash and usually go two or three years with very few acorns, and then they'll have another mass year. But the populations of the things needing those acorns will be too small to eat all the acorns, and it's a very good reproduction strategy. Improved pollination. Oaks are wind pollinated. These are the male catkins. They just release their pollen on the wind. Uh, and whether or not the pollen reaches the female flower, which is the little teeny red things up here, mm -hmm. is a game of chance. Uh, and it's important to note that uh, an oak cannot pollinate itself. So the pollen of a single individual is released before the female flowers are, are mature. Uh, so you need a population of oaks to spread that pollen around. And if everybody's releasing pollen at the same time, there's a much better chance that your, your little flowers will get pollinated. And finally, improved uh, or, or energy allocation. By the way, if you're wondering whether oaks have good fall color, they do. Um, this is a scarlet oak in, in my yard. There's never enough energy to go around. So uh, the thinking is that oaks will either put it towards reproduction and make a lot of acorns or put it towards growth but not both at the same time. And again, these four hypotheses are not mutually exclusive. They all could be operating at the same time to explain masting. Okay, December. Uh, this is when another odd feature of oaks uh, is becomes apparent. And that is that, you know, oaks are, are deciduous trees, but they don't drop their leaves, particularly in the white oak group, particularly in younger trees. They will hold on to them all winter long. Uh, that's a condition called marcescence, uh, and it's, again, it's unusual, so we have to explain it. And the leading explanation is that it wasn't that long ago uh, when there were a lot of large Pleistocene mammals uh, on, on the planet, particularly in the temperate zone. This is the group of, of uh, large mammals that was in Mexico alone, three species of mammoths, giant sloth that, that could reach up 18 feet. Um, camels and horses and rhinoceros. I think there are 44 species of rhinoceros in, in the, the world back then. Many of these guys were grazers. Uh, I shouldn't say grazers. They were browsers, just like the white-tailed deer today, uh, which means they're not eating grass on the ground. They're eating the, um, the buds of future uh, next year's 
leaves, particularly on trees and, and shrubs. Uh, that's what the white-tailed deer does so effectively these days. So the thinking was that if oaks kept the leaves around those valuable buds um, all winter long, it's hard to get to the bud without getting a mouthful of dead dry leaves. And it may have served as protection from those, those grazing mammals. And the distribution of the marcescent leaves supports that hypothesis because they only go up about 18 feet. And above that, uh, there's no mar marcescence. Um, so it's impossible to to prove this hypothesis at this point, but it does make a nice story. And marcescence provides a valuable landscape attribute to oaks that other deciduous trees don't have. You can use them as a screen, even in the wintertime. So if you don't like your neighbor, uh, you can plant a, a white oak and get good, good screening activity all year round. Okay, January, it's cold. Uh, very few people are out looking at their, their oaks. But if you do, you might see little birds flitting around in the tops of, of those trees. So birds like our, our chickadees and our tip mice, um, golden crown kinglets uh, are, are very common out there. What's interesting is, of course, chickadees and tip mice are at our feeders eating seeds, but only 50% of their diet is seeds in the wintertime. The other 50% is insects and spiders. So maybe they're getting insects and spiders up in the oaks. Um, kinglets are, don't eat seeds at all. They're entirely insectivorous. They should have migrated where there's a lot of insects because we know there's not a lot of insects in the trees in the wintertime. Well, Bern uh, Heinrich, uh, a, a retired entomologist uh, up in New England, he actually writes a column in Natural History magazine every month. He doesn't like paradoxes. You know, why would a kinglet stay up north when it should have migrated? So he looked in the crops of golden crown kinglets and he found that they were full of caterpillars in Maine in January, um, which means they're finding caterpillars in those trees. And the caterpillars are there, but they're looking just like sticks, which is why we didn't know they were there. They're looking a lot like sticks and they just sit there all winter long. When it gets cold, there he is, caterpillar shrinks a little bit. It's got antifreeze proteins in its cell and that keeps the caterpillar from bursting. Uh, when it gets below freezing, but then when it's above freezing, they swell a little bit, but they just sit there all winter long. So it's no longer a, a, a paradox about why kinglets stay around. They stay around because there's a lot of food in those trees, particularly oaks. The real question now is why are the caterpillars there? Well, they're just hanging around all winter. There's, there is nothing for them to eat. And they're mature caterpillars too. Uh, well, again, we're, we don't really know, but but um, I think what's happening is that in the springtime, of course, those buds burst and you get uh, nice young leaves. If you overwinter as an egg uh, or if you overwinter as as a uh, an adult or a chrysalis, uh, you've got to find another adult and, and then uh, mate and lay eggs. Or if you overwinter as a chrysalis, you've got to emerge and then find an adult and lay, mate and lay eggs. If you ever winter as a caterpillar, you're way ahead of all of those guys. So you, you can start eating these brand new leaves. You have an unlimited amount of resources early in the spring. So it gives you a real competitive advantage if you make it through the winter. Okay, February, this is the quietest time of oaks uh, for, for in the year, quietest time of year for, for oaks. And it's when I usually talk about oak landscaping myths. Uh, I'm going to essentially skip this part today in the interest of time. Uh, but a lot of people think oaks are too expensive to use. They grow too slowly. They're too big. They're going to fall over and crush our houses. They're going to lift up our hardscape. So I'll just, I'll tell you what I think. Are oaks too expensive? Only if you buy big ones. Plant them small. Do they grow too slowly? No. Uh, are they too big to use in our small lots? We do have a number of species of small oaks. Um, I know there's some people in, from Texas on today. There's oh, what, six or seven species of, of very small oaks in Texas alone. But I recommend using the uh, Quercus prinoides, um, dwarf chestnut oak in, in Ohio. Uh, it, it produces acorns when it's five feet tall. Are they going to crush, crush your house? Uh, I, I suggest you plant them in, in twos or threes. Make little oak groves close together so that their roots interlock and it makes them much more stable when we get the high winds with a lot of water. Uh, and they will only lift up your sidewalk if you plant them over bedrock or over uh, agricultural pan. So make sure you have deep soil and then they will not do that. All right, on to March. Uh, this is when those leaves uh, finally start to fall. So let's talk about the value of oak oak leaf litter. Um, oaks make a lot of leaves, up to 700,000 leaves per tree. 
If you lay them out in a tennis court, that's going to cover four tennis courts. Um, and there's a lot of variability in, in oak leaves. A lot of people think all oaks have lobed leaves, and a lot of species do, but some species do, don't. This is uh, one of the live oaks. This is a, a uh, emery oak in Arizona. Looks like a uh, more like a holly leaf. Um, this is a willow oak, a water oak, uh, shingle oak. So not all of them have, have lobes, but there is a tremendous amount of variability in oak leaf shape. And they last a long time when they when they drop. The single oak leaf can take up to three years to, to break down. Uh, and that helps them accomplish their, their main goal. Uh, they've got two main goals. One is to protect the moisture in the soil. They form a blanket over the soil and protect the soil community. There are more species that live underground than above ground, and they all need high humidity. Uh, so it's one of the reasons you want to leave your leaf litter on the ground to protect your, your soil community, including the mycorrhizae that are transferring nutrients to uh, the roots of your plants. The other major uh, goal is to return the nutrients that that tree used to the soil so that they can be used again. When we rake away our leaves, we're raking away all the nutrients that our trees need. And if you do that year after year after year, you're starving your tree and it's no wonder they don't live the 900 years they're supposed to live. There are also an awful lot of creatures in these leaf in these leaves. When you rake them away, you're really uh, removing a lot of the biodiversity from your your property. So people worry that uh, if they don't rake their leaves away, their plants aren't going to be able to get through those leaves. They worry too much about that. This is a, a natural planting of, of ferns. Nobody planted. I just stopped and took this picture of big white oak here. The ferns get through the leaf litter, no problem at all. Um, and I've taken some pictures at my house. This is uh, wood poppies coming through. Right? We don't rake the leaves at our house. I'm never home to do it anyway, but uh, we don't need to do it. The wood poppies are popping through and, and by the time they're blooming, you can't even see the leaf litter anymore. Uh, so a lot of things that do well in, in leaf litter. This is native Pachysandra, Virginia creeper. Um, so unless you pile five feet of leaves in your, your flower beds, uh, you don't have to worry about that. Lots of things living in those leaves, 250,000 mites per square meter, 100,000 springtails, little columbulins. Um, and these guys are all detritivores. They're breaking down the leaves so that the nutrients get into the soil and the tree can use it again. 90,000 proturans, those are primitive insects, a million nematodes. Again, more species underground than above ground. Uh, and they're absolutely necessary to healthy soil communities. But there's some of the things that, that we find quite beautiful living in oak leaf litter as well. Banded hair streak uh, develops as a caterpillar in oak leaf litter. Eat stuff like that. You'd never find the, the caterpillar. I've never actually found one, but the butterfly is fairly, fairly common. And there's 70 species of moths. We call them litter moths. Things like the ambiguous litter moth, the American idea, the dark spotted palthus, and 67 other species are living in the leaf litter that comes down from our trees, particularly the oak trees. If you've ever seen a white-throated sparrow or a towhee doing a little, little dance in the leaf litter, they're, they're pushing, kicking leaf litter back. They're looking for these guys. This is this is the food that helps gets them through the winter time. So when you rake all those leaves away, you're depriving your birds of food as well. And then of course, eating all that stuff is the uh, the predators that that depend on them. Many species of ground beetles, um, spiders, and and centipedes, and of course our fireflies. Uh, people I hear all the time, why don't I have the fireflies I had when I was growing up? Well, they're not flies. Uh, they're actually beetles. Uh, this is the adult, and there's the lantern that, that lights up, that, um, the way they communicate as adults. But this is what the larva looks like. It looks like a, you know, a little prehistoric uh, dinosaur, but it's a predator in leaf litter. When we rake all those leaves away, we're removing what those, those uh, firefly larvae need. So if you have firefly larvae in your yard, you're doing lots of things correctly. So here's a family uh, I visited uh, this this family, yeah, I can't remember where they are, but this is a way you can keep leaf litter right on your property. Um, just you know, make a little little bed. You you rake all the leaves in there, then you can plant liberally through it. Um, plugs right in the in the winter time or in the springtime, and lots of things are living in that and keep the leaves right on your property. Okay, April. Uh, this is when those buds finally do break. It, life starts starts to uh, become green. It's also the chance. For you to see one of the most ephemeral interactions in all of nature. It takes about five minutes a year. 
happens uh, a lot, but only for five minutes. So you have to be there at the right time and, and see it. And I'm talking about when cynipid gall wasps lay their eggs in the buds of your, your oak trees. That's what a cynipid gall wasp looks like. And here we have a, a different species. Here's the female who's injecting an egg into the bud of uh, one of my white oaks. Um, this is a male that he's not mating with her. He's only mated, already mated with her, but he's you call it riding her. He's making sure that she doesn't mate with another male before she lays another egg. After she lays this egg, she's going to go to another bud and do the same thing. So he's guarding her to make sure that she uses his, his sperm. This is a male who wishes he was this male. Along with that egg, she's injecting the egg into the bud, but she's also injecting plant hormones into that bud. And it's the hormones that are going to create what we call a goal. These are undifferentiated cells here. We call them, they're just like stem cells. They can grow in any direction. And the direction they do grow in is going to be modified by the hormones, the plant hormones that the, the cynipid injects into the plant. And of course, the oak itself has plant hormones. And the end result is a compromise between the oak and the cynipid to create a species-specific shape uh, that we call a gall. People, people liken galls to cancerous growths on, on trees. And I don't like that analogy because cancerous growths are uncontrolled growth. Galls are highly controlled growth. You can recognize the species of galler by the, the type of gall that it made because they're that specific. There are a lot of, of galls out there, a thousand species uh, globally of cynipids that interact with, with oaks. A single oak tree can support more than 70 species of, of gallers. It's very hard to find an oak tree that does not have at least one species of gall on it. And many of those galls are, are hollow. Uh, which is interesting. If you cut open, this is the apple oak gall. Uh, it's quite large. There's a, a uh, very hard center in there, and it's inside that center that the, the cynipid larva is developing. But then you've got a lot of air. So what's that all about? Uh, well, it turns out that cynipid gallers have more natural enemies, more parasitoids, other insects that attack them, lay their eggs in them, usually other wasps, than any other type of, of insect. So they're very heavily uh, predated by these, these parasitoids. This is a female pterymid parasitoid and she's got a very long ovipositor. And the object is to get the distance between where the galler is and the outside of the gall to be longer than this ovipositor so that the, the parasitoid cannot reach uh, the cynipid to lay an egg in it. So in the beginning, the galls are small. That's when the parasitoids actually can reach those gallers, but they grow very quickly to get the, the cynipid beyond the reach of that ovipositor. This is the uh, species of galler that comes out of the apple oak gall. Um, it's a very beautiful thing. In the west, this is a pterymid that has the longest ovipositor in the country, and that has selected for the largest oak in, or the largest gall in the country. Um, this is on the Gary Oak. Quercus gariana, because the distance from the outside of the gall to the inside of the gall has got to be bigger than the length of that ovipositor. Otherwise, the cynipid succeeds. A lot of variation in, in galls, um, fantastic variation in galls, and many of them are quite beautiful. A lot of them are, are simply spheres on leaves or spheres on branches. Uh, some look like that. So a lot of them look like diseases. People mistake them for plant diseases. Um, this, this is one at my house. It looks like pottery, looks like a brain. Um, this looks like a buttocks uh, or a spindle or a candy. What does it call it? Cotton candy. I just named all these things. Looks like a bowling pin. Um, a lot of pretty galls in, in California. A guy named Tim Boomer takes pictures of them. Little candies, more candy galls. Um, this is the cutest one. I call it the gnome house gall. The, the door there is where the actual galler actually left the, the gall, um, but it's really cute. Um, this, this is a single leaf that produced a lot of gallers. There were four galls on this leaf, and each one of them housed, uh, I don't know, 50, 60 uh, individual gallers. So a, a single female laid a lot of eggs in, in that gall. And of course, they've all emerged. Uh, that's what the holes are. So it was a very productive leaf. And it turns out that, that oak galls played an important role in our recorded history. 
if you grind up a gall like this and add particular chemicals to it, it makes an indelible black ink. And that is the ink that was used to record human history for thousands of years. The Bible was written with gall ink. The Magna Carta was written with gall ink. The Declaration of Independence was written with gall ink. All of the writings of the, the Middle Age uh, scribes and, and monks, Leonardo da Vinci, they're all using gall ink. So that's a fun little fact you can use at your next cocktail party. Okay, May, the leaves actually have expanded. Uh, the new biological year really has begun. Uh, and of course, following the expansion of those leaves comes the caterpillars that eat those leaves. And following the caterpillars that eat those leaves come the birds that eat those caterpillars. It's all very well designed. We're talking about spring migration. It is not an accident. The birds move up from, from uh, Central and South America when there's a lot of things to fuel their migration. And those things are caterpillars. Remember, plants have not made seeds or berries yet in the spring, so they're depending on insects to provide the fat that fuels that migration. And birders know that if, if you wanna see warblers, you go to oaks because that's where the warblers are foraging. I had a student, Christy Beal, several years ago, measure the amount of time warblers spent foraging in um, different types of trees and cemeteries. This is the Phagaceae, that's the family the oaks are in, oaks, chestnuts, and beaches, but there were no chestnuts and beaches in her sample size. So this is all oaks. They spend much more time in oaks than in any other, than in pines or birches or any other type of tree because that's where the food is. Uh, and again, the food is largely caterpillars, things like the purple crested slug caterpillar. They're called slug caterpillars because the head is tucked up underneath, not because they're really slugs. The buck moth, the white marked tussock moth, the saddle prominent, double line prominent, white dotted prominent, the checkered fringe prominent, the laugher, the lace cap caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the skiff moth, the white blotched heterocampa, the oblique heterocampi, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the banded hair streak, the red line panopoda, the yellow neck caterpillar, the smaller parasa, the unicorn caterpillar, the crown slug, the street dagger moth, the hesitant dagger moth, the epilated dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the medium dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the red humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the confused wood grain, the spun, or what is this, the spiny oak slug. This is the uh, spun glass slug. It's the uh, I think it's the coolest caterpillar in North America. Uh, and hundreds more species of caterpillars eat oaks and fuel that migration. I've been counting the number of oaks that uh, occur or the number of caterpillars that occur on our property since we put the plants back. Uh, I've been doing it for six, six years, taking pictures of every single species. And I am up to 1,257 species of just moths so far in my yard. And 28% of them use oaks. So almost 30% of the moths that fuel the food web in my yard uh, come from oaks, making oaks really important plants. Uh, and it's because our plants are making so many caterpillars that we've had 62 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres. Not flew by, but bred. They're each using thousands of caterpillars to get their nestlings to maturity. And that's why I call oaks keystone species. Remember what a keystone is? It's the stone in the middle of the Roman arch. And if you take that stone out of the arch, the arch collapses. Well, if you take keystone plants out of the local food web, the food web collapses because they are making most of the food. Just 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. And oaks are the best keystone plant across the country. Uh, they support more than 950 species of caterpillars nationwide. No other plant genus comes close to that. Why do we need so many caterpillars? Well, they are the bread and butter of terrestrial food webs. They are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So if we design landscapes without a lot of caterpillars in them, we're going to have failed food webs and eventually failed ecosystems. That's another reason that oaks are so important. They are making more caterpillars than any other type of plant. And it's not just the migrants that need those caterpillars. All the, the uh, non-migrants that overwinter here, when they breed, they're rearing their young on caterpillars as well. Chickadees, for example, need 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to get one clutch to the point where they leave the nest. And after they leave the nest, they continue to feed them caterpillars another 21 days. So caterpillars, totally necessary for our breeding birds. Okay, June, June is cicada month. Uh, I say that because, what, two years ago, we had the periodical cicada 
I think you had it in, in Ohio. Uh, you're probably familiar with it, but we'll go over it uh, briefly. Both the 17-year brood and the 13-year brood, uh, these are, are um, they're called periodical cicadas because they will stay underground as nymphs for either 17 years or 13 years, depending on which brood they're from. Then they emerge and mass. Uh, and, you know, we know when it's coming, uh, which means the media gets a hold of it. And, you know, they didn't have a lot of good things to say about the, the cicada emergence. It just it exemplifies how we vilify nature. We vilify insects all the time. It was going to be a terrible scourge that we should fear. Uh, they're going to sing so loudly, we'll go crazy and kill our babies. We should consider moving so we don't have to endure it. It's an invasion. Nothing good. Uh, well, it's none of those things. It's one of the most fantastic biological events that you'll ever be privileged to to witness. Uh, and it was a big one. This is uh, the the skins, the shed exuvii of the uh, cicadas that emerged in front of an oak right in front of my building at Townsend Hall, the University of Delaware. Of course, once they come out of the ground, they leave little holes. They have aerated your soil for you. It allows oxygen and water to get down to the roots, very important, and they do it for free. There were a lot of them, uh, so many that 11 Mississippi kites flew up from who knows where and ate those cicadas in Newark, Delaware uh, for about two weeks. And then they then they left. This is what happens. They emerge at night. They hang upside down from vegetation, split their skin, swing down, and then they hang from that, that skin and tan their skin. Right now, they're like a soft shell crab. Um, a lot of things uh, are, are, can eat them at this point. So that's why they come out at night so nothing can see them. They'll hang there till they, they uh, harden up. Then they can go off and start their, their adult life. And their adult life, if you're a male, means you're going to sing and try to attract a female. They vibrate two membranes in their thorax uh, and make a loud buzzing sound. And the louder they buzz, the greater the chance they're going to attract a female because females like loud males. Uh, that one did attract a female. They mate, and now it's the female's turn. She's going to inject eggs into the branch of a of a tree, and they do like oaks. This is a female laying an egg in the twig of a pin oak in my front yard. Um, it's hard to do. Get a pin and try to stick it into the branch of a of a an oak tree. You're going to bend the pin, but these guys get it in there. There she is. She's she's got it all the way in. Uh, so she's going to lay an egg. Then she's going to go right down, lay six or seven eggs in a row, and then move to another branch and, and do it all over again. Uh, and from the point where they lay their eggs out, often, not always, but often, the branch dies. That's called flagging. People get upset about it. They say, oh, they're going to kill my tree. They're not going to kill the tree. They're going to they're gonna prune your tree once every 17 years, uh, and your tree will be ready for it. The eggs hatch, the little guys fall to the ground, they tunnel underneath uh, the soil and they feed on the roots of trees for the next 17 years. Uh, and they can, the trees, you know, they're, they're feeding on xylem, which is essentially water. Up to 50, 40,000 nymphs uh, have been recorded on a single tree without any impact, measurable impact on the tree itself because they're simply eating uh, essentially water. They really do like oaks. I had a student look at the amount of flagging on different species of trees in Newark, Delaware. The green bars are different species of oaks. So they do lay on other trees, but they like oaks the most. And then they die. Takes takes about three weeks. Um, that's it. So the, the real question is, why do they spend 17 years underground? And the, the uh, favorite hypothesis, again, is predator satiation. A lot of things eat cicadas. Uh, all the birds and the mammals eat cicadas. And, but there is no cicada eater that can wait 17 years in between meals. So the populations of these things are never big enough to handle all of the cicadas that come out at the same time. All right, July. July is, uh, is the month of the night chorus. Uh, and I'm talking about katydids. Um, or male katydids, of course, uh, sing. They, they have sclerotized portions of their front wings. They will raise their wings and move them back and forth and make a, a uh, species-specific scraping sound. There's a scraper and a file there. Uh, and of course, if you're wondering why Katie did sing at night, this is why. Once upon a time, there was a young woman named Katie who fell in love with a handsome young man. Alas, he did not share her feelings, and he married another. 
Soon thereafter, he and his young bride were found poisoned in their bed. Who perpetrated the crime was never determined, but some say the insects in the tree were watching that night, and each summer they solved the mystery by singing Katie did. Ooh, Katie did. Katie did. Mm -hmm. You've probably all heard that. I did a lot of camping in North Jersey when I was growing up, and that song sang me to sleep many, many a night. Um, this is what a female Katie did looks like before she's uh, uh, totally matured. There's her ovipositor but her wings haven't expanded yet. There are four species of katydids that frequent our oak forests in the, in the east, only one in the west. Uh, but it's the same thing. The females are going to the male that is singing the loudest. Uh, that is why they are loud. And this is what happens when they lay their eggs. They simply glue them to a, a twig. They're large, and these guys have already hatched, but sometimes people find these and wonder what they, what they are. They're usually doing it up in the canopy. But uh, in late fall, early September is when those katydids start to come down and we see them more frequently. Okay, August. Uh, oak leaves get really tough uh, in, in August. They're full of tannins, yeah. full of uh, yeah. uh, lipids. Well, you got somebody's got a mute. Oh, it did. Oh, dear. <laughs> so in the spring, they're really tender. Uh, and a lot of things can can use oak leaves, but by August, okay, they're do it right now. stiff as boards. And it's very tough for insects to eat those leaves when they're when they're very, very stiff. But there's a couple of strategies that insects have, particularly those caterpillars. They all eat gregariously. They eat as groups. Uh, and apparently that's easier to get their little mouths around those leaves when they do that. This is the yellow neck caterpillar when it's small. That's what it looks like when it's uh, almost mature, but they're still eating in a group. Uh, common uh, adaptation uh, for, for caterpillars in August. This is the uh, orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, gregarious feeding. Uh, and then people see all these caterpillars on their, their trees and they get, get upset. This is the tree we're following. And in, I guess it was 2014, I walked around the bottom of that tree uh, and counted the number of caterpillars just on the branches on the lower part of the tree. And I came up with 410 caterpillars, including 115 yellow net caterpillars. Right away, I st uh, stood back and took a picture of the tree. So I could ask you, how many of those caterpillars do you see? You don't see any of them. And how much caterpillar damage do you see? You don't see that either. And this is the distance at which we view our trees. But if I knocked on your door and said, you've got 410 caterpillars on your tree, um, most people would get upset, call the man, get the spray can, save the tree. You don't have to save the tree. Oaks are really good at sharing some of the energy they've captured from the sun and through photosynthesis turned it into food. And because they're willing to share it, we've got life in our yards. I met a woman in New Orleans several years ago, Tammany Baumgarten who recommends that we all practice the 10 step program. Take 10 steps back from your trees and all of your insect problems disappear. And I think that's really good advice. Another way to get around the leaf toughness is to become really, really small, become a leaf miner. You're only gonna eat the inside of the leaf. The toughness is all on the upper and lower uh, epidermis, uh, but the palisade mesophyll, the parenchymal cells uh, are where the nutrition is and it remains soft and edible. So this is a serpentine mine. It's actually a little moth. The uh, egg was laid here and the caterpillar hatched and it's mining the leaves. Looks like a snake. Uh, the black line in here, that's the caterpillar poops, the frass. It pushes it all to the middle. Then it pupates here. And that's the amount of leaf, eater, leaf material it's going to eat in its entire life. So the oak can easily share that. This is a blotch mine where the uh, caterpillar just goes in a circle and makes a, a blotch. Here it is, uh, backlit. There it is, a very nice photo by Salvador Vitenza. Um, doesn't look much like a caterpillar because it's got all those adaptations for, for leaf mining. Uh, but in fact, when they come out as an adult, they look just like a moth. They're small. This is one of the Cameraria species, several species of Cameraria on oaks. Solitary oak leaf miner, the gregarious oak leaf miner, the oak tentiform leaf miner. It's a very viable strategy for getting around the toughness of, of oak leaves. Okay, September, our final month, this is when crickets start to become uh, common. You know, the black crickets on the ground are singing. If a cricket gets into your house and sings, it's good luck, by the way, so don't, don't kill it. Uh, but there are also crickets up on bushes. We call them, or trees, call them tree and bush crickets. Many of them are pale in color or light, light brown. 
Uh, but, you know, they're doing the same thing that the cicadas and the katydids are doing. The males are singing to attract females. Uh, and But these guys are very smart about it. They will find a hole in a leaf or they'll chew a hole in the leaf. Then they stick their head through there and raise their wings and move them back and forth, make their chirping sound. Uh, now, leaves are typically have a slight parabolic shape to them. So what that does is project the sound farther and louder than if this guy sang on a flat surface. Uh, so in other words, he's sending a false message to the female. If you could believe a male would send us a false message to a female. He's saying, I am louder than I really am. And she falls for it. She comes and she mates with him. So don't feel sorry for the female though, because he's, he's probably smarter than the other males. And that's good enough. September is also a, a good time to see walking sticks. You don't usually see them because they're way up in the canopy. Um, sometimes they're, they're common enough to do a little defoliation, particularly in West Virginia, but usually you only see one or two a year. This is one on an emery oak that I found in, in Arizona. They're called walking sticks, of course, because they look like sticks and they walk. Um, this is the species that's common in the, the east, uh, but they, do, they reproduce in a very interesting way. The females just walk along the canopy and they drop eggs to the, to the uh, forest floor. But there's an interesting relationship with spring ephemerals, things like uh, milk, what is this? Uh, red bloodroot. Bloodroot has pods. And when those pods mature and they split open, they have very colorful seeds in there with a little white structure attached to them called an eliasome. Well, it turns out that eliasomes uh, are really attractive to ants. Ants love to eat them. So the ants will come, they will pick up the seed, take it back to the nest. Everybody eats the eliasome, and then they, they throw the seed. They can't eat the seed, so they throw it into the garbage dump of the nest, which is one inch below the surface of the soil, and it's a perfect place for this seed to germinate. Well, it turns out that walking stick eggs uh, might be mimicking uh, the eliasomes on spring ephemerals. There's a white stripe that looks like it, and I'll bet there's some chemical mimicry there. In any case, the ants are attracted to the walking stick eggs. They pick them up, they take them back to the nest, they find out they can't eat them, so they throw them in the garbage dump, and that is where the eggs can hatch safely. All right, we have, we have gone very quickly through the year um, and talked about just a few of the things that are happening on oaks. So now it's time to get, get serious and, and talk about fixing the world. Uh, we've created a biodiversity crisis. We've created a, a uh, climate change crisis. So we have two major crises on planet Earth, um, but this one's not getting enough attention. We hear about things disappearing. We hear about our birds disappearing. We've lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. Our birds are not disappearing. We are killing them. We're killing our insects. We've got global insect decline. We're killing the nature that keeps us alive. And that's why we're in the sixth great extinction event that the planet has ever experienced. So it is a global crisis. The good news is it has a grassroots solution, one that can involve every single one of us. And this is how. There are four things that every landscape has to do today if we're going to truly reach a sustainable relationship with the nature that supports us. Every landscape has to capture carbon to help climate change. Every landscape has to manage the watershed in which it lies. Every landscape has to support a diverse community of pollinators not to help agriculture, but because they're pollinating 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. And every landscape has to support a complex food web. In other words, they've got to pass on uh, energy so that you have animals in your local ecosystem. When you plant an oak, you are accomplishing all four of those major ecological goals better than other plants can. You're capturing more carbon than other trees. You're managing the watershed with those big root systems better than other trees. You're supporting a more complex food web by far than other trees. You're even helping pollinators, even though oaks are wind pollinated. Uh, and this is kind of new information. We didn't know this, but pollinators are going to, particularly the native bees, are going to the catkins of oaks when they're releasing pollen, gathering up that pollen, and then they're rearing their young on it. Um, there's several species of bees that depend on oak pollen. Uh, so even though they're not actually pollinating the oaks, they're not taking it to the female flowers, oaks are supporting those pollinators. Well, despite all those landscape attributes, our oaks are in trouble these days. Uh, we've got um, problems from, from uh, insect or, or uh, pre-emergent herbicides uh, causing what we call oak tatters. Uh, 
Uh, so they put down the pre-emergence to make sure weeds don't come up. This is what a healthy white oak looks like. That's what one with oak tatters looks like. And it's because of volatiles that come out off those, those uh, pre-emergent herbicides. Very common in uh, the Midwest, huge problem. The old giants of our forests are gone because we've cut them down uh, or, or uh, well, we have cut them down. <laughs> the percentage of oaks in our, our Eastern forest has been cut in half. Uh, because we cut the oaks down uh, and because we've suppressed fire, which oaks like. We've also introduced a number of, of, of serious oak pests and diseases, things like the, the spongy moth, um, things like oak wilt, um, bacterial leaf scorch, sudden oak death syndrome, taking a, a tremendous toll on our oaks. Deer overabundance is preventing young oaks from coming into our forest because they eat all of them. Habitat fragmentation is hindering oak pollination. Oaks have to be close enough to each other so that the pollen can reach uh, other trees. Uh, and now with fragmentation, that's not always happening. And because of all those things, 28 of our 91 North American oak species are now threatened. One third of the global oaks are endangered. The Oregon white oak, for example, has lost 97% of its range because it grew where people have uh, houses and agriculture. There are 2,300 species in Great Britain that rely on oaks that are now threatened because of the loss of oaks in, in Great Britain. Now, we humans live our lives out in a very brief instant of ecological time, and we cannot return those giant oak trees to our forests in that time period, but we can start the process. And in no time at all, those oaks get big enough to assume many, not all, but many of their keystone positions in our, our yard. Everybody on the planet is responsible for good earth stewardship because everybody on the planet requires good earth stewardship. And the best way to exercise your responsibility is to embrace the power of oaks. So for the sake of our turkeys, our chickadees, our woodpeckers, our warblers, our jays, our thrushes, our fireflies, our galls, our weevils, our orthopterans, our moths, for us, for our own sake, Plant an oak, plant a living community, plant the future. Thanks very much. Thank you, Doug. Um, we're gonna have the Q&A session right now. Um, gosh, I learned so much from that. I'm gonna have to review this recording though. <laughs> There's a lot of information. And just so everyone knows, um, I'm gonna send the recording out to all of you so you can review it too. Um, I'm going to begin with a question of my own, and then I'm going to turn it over to Anne because when I was uh, the internet kicked me off for a, for a brief time, I lost all the questions that were in the chat. But um, Anne has them, hopefully. Uh, so I'm going to ask my question, and then I'll turn it over to Anne. My question is, Doug, I have a little oak. Uh, it's a volunteer. It volunteered in my our perennial garden, and it's surrounded by a lot of junk, weeds, and but some flowers too. Uh, I asked my my uh, local expert, I call him Alan Oakley, who, who's planted about 24 or 25 oaks in our street. I asked him, when can I transplant it to a better spot? And they said, you better wait till it gets at least a foot tall. Well, it wasn't a foot tall a while ago, but now it is. But now it's winter is coming. Is fall a good time to transplant or should I wait till spring? Early fall is a good time to transplant. But so I, you, missed, I missed the boat, did I? I would say, yeah, um, because what happens is you want to wait for the roots to get out into the soil, the surrounding soil, before you start having heavy freezes, because that heaves the soil. Um, so it's a little risky. You, you probably get away with it now, but I would wait until, say, March and move it move it then. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Anne, it, can you continue, please? <laughs> You're on mute, so unmute yourself, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to start with one of the last questions, um, and it's, will the fires in the Western U.S. and Canada uh, help with oak survival and propagation? Yes. But, you know, we suppress fire for more than 100 years and we build up a tremendous amount of fuel. So now the fires that are occurring uh, wherever are typically crown fires and those are deadly. They kill they kill the trees. Um, what what the oaks 
evolved with are ground fires. They're they're not canopy fires. They've got very thick bark and it keeps the uh, competing, you know, maples and cherries uh, away. Now, having said that, I was in California in May, I guess, and I was in an area with Southern California. It had suffered a, a, a serious crown fire some years earlier. And, you know, if you looked out over the landscape, there were just a bunch of charred trees and it looked like all the oaks were dead. But if you look closely, all of those oaks were coming up from the base alive. They were not dead uh, and they will recover. But um, crown fires is not what we're trying to encourage. We want to uh, get get back to, uh, you know, low intensity ground fires that never reach the canopy. And they do Thank help. Thank you. Um, another question is, what is it about the oaks that make them so attractive to so many Lepidoptera? I pronounced it wrong, but. Yeah, you pronounced it right. Um, okay, well, there, there are four or five hypotheses. Uh, one, several things. First of all, it's a very old genus. Uh, so it's been around for a long time. Things could adapt to it. Uh, it has a very big range. So it's spread, it's, you know, it's worldwide, uh, particularly in the temperate zone. So again, opportunity for adaptation there. It protects itself with tannins. Uh, that's the primary defense. And apparently tannins are easier for for insects to to uh, get around to be able to circumvent than other types of plant diseases or, or uh, defenses. Um, uh, and there are a lot of species of, of oaks. So again, more more uh, opportunities for, for adaptation. So all of those things together uh, are probably what explains all of the species that use oaks. Great. Um, here's a planting question. For transplanting an 18 inch tall red oak seedling, how large a root ball is best? You'd be surprised how big those roots have gotten <laughs> when it's 18 inches long. You're not gonna get all of them. The larger the better, but you're not gonna get all of them. But at that age, it will recover and it will, it will grow. I transplanted a white oak about that size when we moved to our, our new house, when it had grown up in our flower bed. Um, it is now, it's about 75 feet tall. So, you know, it sat there for a year or two rebuilding the roots that I couldn't get, but it'll, it'll do fine. Okay. Um, uh, I think maybe you answered this in the beginning of your talk, but last fall, I planted over 50 white oak acorns, most of which had sprouted roots, maybe one and no more than one sprouted. Why? Uh, lots of reasons. <laughs> there are rodents all winter long that eat those those uh, acorns. Well, the the squirrels will pull them up and eat the nut off the uh, the root. Um, crows will do the same thing. Uh, so it's probably just predation over the winter time that that uh, nailed your oaks. You know, I th I think about when when I planted the acorns at my house, I got very high survivorship. And I think the reason I did is because I planted it when our house was a biological desert. <laughs> there weren't any, there wasn't anything there. No rodents, other things there to eat them. Today, if I would do that, I'd probably get just like you. I, most of them would get, would get hammered. So what I do now is I plant the oaks in the fall in a flower pot and I protect that flower pot from the rodents over the winter time and then plant it in the spring once it comes up. Okay. Um, there's just a couple more questions. Is there a thickness of leaf litter that is too much for a native flower garden? Yes. Um, if you, you know, if you're raking all the leaves off your lawn and you get it to be a foot thick or two feet thick, that, that will suppress the, the growth of your, your plants. Uh, the best is just a normal layer of, of, of leaves, maybe six inches and they settle down. Uh, the plants are very good at getting getting through those those leaves. So, um, I always tell the story of my my son uh, bought a new house a couple of years ago, and the first fall he called me up and he said he said Dad I have too many leaves what should I do with the leaves, and I said put them in your flower beds and he said I don't have enough flower beds and I said exactly, mm -hmm. so that is how you reduce your lawn you put more flower beds increase the size of them under your trees and then you will have enough space for those leaves without making them too thick. Okay, great. Um, 
I think we've got two more questions. Is it possible to overplant oaks? Is anyone planting hops, which is the American horn um, beam, red mulberry, et cetera? Are we possibly? I've got, I've got hop horn beam, so I'm planting that. Um, so yeah, we don't want a monoculture of anything. You do want diversity out there. I talk about oaks as being the best because they are the best, but it doesn't mean that's all you, you want. You want a diversity. It depends on the size of your property. If you have room for one tree, I would make it an oak. But if you have an acre and you got room for a number of trees, then yeah, get diversity in there. Um, hop horn beef, a good plant. Uh, what was the other one? Um, red mulberry. Mulberry. You're not going to plant red mulberry because there is no more red mulberry. It's all white mulberry. Even if somebody sells you one, it's a white mulberry. You have to go to Texas to find red mulberry these days. And that's because white mulberry crosses with red mulberry through introgression. The end result is white mulberry. So we've essentially lost that species from the East. Um, even though, and it's very hard to tell them apart. Uh, that, you know, in terms of making caterpillars, that's that's really low. Almost nothing eats mulberry, red or white. Does make good berries, uh, but it's certainly not a keystone plant. Okay, and a, a question that's related to that is, um, we have trees that have been susceptible to uh, diseases that have wiped them out or almost wiped them out. Is that something that the oaks um, will possibly be in danger of. We have introduced some serious oak diseases. There's no doubt about it. The good news is there is resistance to all those diseases in oak populations. There's a number of, of individuals that are susceptible and they will die. Your arborist will, will charge you a lot of money to try to save them, but I've never heard of one actually succeeding. Um, they always die in the end. Uh, but again, the good news is that there are individuals that have good resistance to oak wilt, to bacterial leaf scorch, even to um, sudden oak death syndrome. So uh, the object is to encourage those. And the blue jays will help because the oaks that don't die will be the ones that make the acorns that the blue jays dis dis distribute. What you don't want to do is, is listen to the forester who says, don't plant any more oaks, it's going to die. I say yeah. plant twice as many oaks so we can find the resistant ones. Many of them will die. It is true. But first of all, they won't die for, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. And in the meantime, you get a lot of good, good ecological use out of them. But we've got to, we've got to favor those resistant genotypes because doing without oaks altogether is not an option. Thank you. Well, those, thanks everyone for those wonderful questions. Doug, thank you for your answers. Um, we do have a drawing for your book, and um, we're going to give three away. I have um, the three names, but I first want to re remind the winners, please type your name and your address, because we're going to mail the book to you in the chat, and then that way um, we'll know where to send it. And the first winner is Elaine. Boaz, B-O-A-Z, and the second is James Lieber, L-I-E-B-E-R, and the third is Cheryl Wall, W-A-L-L. -L. So Elaine Boaz, James Lieber, and Cheryl Wall, congratulations, and please put your snail mail address in the chat so we can get the book to you. Okay, I'm gonna turn things over to Ron. Well, thank you, Anne, and thank you for picking up the questions that I, I lost. <laughs> um, and congratulations to our winners um, of The Nature of Oaks, our three winners. And if you didn't win, guess what? You can buy the book. And I urge <laughs> you to buy the book. <laughs> it's It's widely available and it's really amazing, so. Yeah, like have, have some fun and read read through it month by month, and you know what to do each month, as Doug has pointed out. And thank you, Doug. It was really wonderful. You're welcome. Good luck, everybody. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Doug. Uh, I just want to remind everybody, you're all invited to our next uh, presentation by a distinguished writer and researcher, 
Dennis Strabell, the author of The Power of Scenery, Frederick Law Olmsted and the Origin of Our National Parks. And you can register for that online on our website at factohio.org. There it is, our website. And you can register for all the upcoming events, um, our distinguished speaker events going into 2024. I think we have them up through uh, May or June now. And these are some other upcoming ones that are coming along. Okay, as I uh, promised slash threatened, uh, we're gonna have a we're gonna have a short um, general meeting led by our president Margaret Mills because we have an amendment to consider to our bylaws. So Margaret, I'm gonna put that up on the screen in just a moment so you, everybody can see it. It's on my desktop. Okay, so I'll take leave it uh, to your good graces, Margaret. Thank you, Rod. Um, uh, thank you so much, Doug. This was an, an amazing presentation. I'm sure that we all have a lot to think about. And um, if we haven't purchased or read the book or borrowed it, um, we need to do that and I certainly will. And now you all are invited to participate in uh, this very brief general meeting to consider bylaw change. Um, it's on uh, the screen and um, the notice of the um, proposed bylaw change in accordance with the bylaws uh, was sent um, to you 30 days before this general meeting. So I now then call the general meeting to order and the uh, bylaws are displayed. Um, I'm going to uh, go ahead and read the bylaw changes. Uh, and you can then um, have some time for, um, uh, for questions, discussions. Article 8, Section 1 of the bylaws shall be amended as follows. The word four and the numeral four shall be changed to the word six and the numeral six. And the word six and the numeral six shall be changed to the word 11 and the numeral 11. In other words, four to six and six to 11. Um, Old uh, eight section one, the board of directors shall consist of the following officers, president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, and four to six directors without designated office and the immediate past president. Proposed um, today, new um, section one as amended, the board of directors shall consist of the following officers, president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, and six to 11 directors without designated office and immediate past president. Are there um, any questions about that? The board is proposing this um, to strengthen and diversify our board. There's a lot of work for the board to do. The more and more every year we are, we are advancing and becoming quite uh, proficient and prolific in all of the areas that we uh, look into and are serving um, and so it's most helpful to have more members. So are there any questions or are there, uh, is there discussion? I don't know how to do that. So I'm assuming somebody who figures out the, <laughs> knows the technology can get us to the, the place where we can check and see if there are questions or discussion. Uh, I would, let's see if people will I'm trying to see if I can see the whole the whole group here. Or maybe if someone just wants to unmute and speak, that would be fine too. Just tell us your name. Can you folks unmute yourselves? I wonder if they can unmute themselves. Ah. Well, I've been muting and unmuting all afternoon, so. Oh, well, you're special. <laughs> Well, I know that, but <laughs> let's see if I, I don't see. Uh, let's see, uh, Judy, can you unmute? Judy Como Hart, can I'm, you? I'm unmuted. Okay, so people can unmute. 
because she's okay. not she's not a co-host. And so anybody who wants to unmute and wants to speak up, um, President wants you to speak up. Well, not hearing um, any discussion or questions, um, I would uh, accept that there uh, that the voting is in order. So I guess Ron, you need to go to the broad screen of everyone, so so we can see their hands. There we go. Yeah. All in favor of let, the. Let me um, let me take the spotlight off of people that it's on, so I can see everybody. Yeah, uh, that's a, yeah. Off me. And off Margaret. <laughs> I'm and shy. Off, <laughs> and off of uh, Anne. Let's see, can you see everybody? Gallery. There we are. Okay, uh, now I can. I think I can see everybody now. I can't, but um, I can just see Anne right now. Yeah, you have me on spotlight. Oh, sorry. I'll get you off spotlight. There. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have okay. a lot of people still this here, so. Better. Um, this you want to call for the vote again, Margaret? Or you could have them raise their hands. Uh, I I do. Um, Jean, do you have a question, or are you raising your hand to vote yes? Okay. Um, then I as it's much better that I can see everybody. This this is, <laughs> makes me happy. Um, so without uh, further discussion, uh, please raise your hand uh, if you are in favor of this amendment. Are there any opposed to the amendment? Seeing none, um, I, I just am appreciative of the vote. Um, we have a wonderful board looking for, for more folks to be a part of our board and to, as we mentioned before, to diversify and expand so that we can continue to expand our work. Um, as we move forward. So thank you um, very much. Those of you who voted yes, would you like to be a board member? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, as we depart today, unless there's anything from anyone else who wishes to speak, Anne or Ron or Judy, um, any, any other discussions today? And I'm going to um, close us out with um, our benediction for this afternoon. And incidentally, those of you who asked for uh, the prayer that I led at the beginning, I did my best to put the, um, the link in the chat, but I'm not real good at this. So if you didn't get it, um, let Ron know. <laughs> yeah, if you send it to me, Margaret, I can put it with the recording when I send oh, the recording out. Bless you. I will do that. Okay. Then let us close with our benediction. Blessed are you, creator of the universe, who have made all things good and revealed yourself to us in your creation. Grant that we may always use created things gratefully and share your gift with those in need out of your love. And as we leave today, may the words we have heard and the messages we have been given remain with us in our thoughts and actions. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. We'll see you next month. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>